Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tan King Hua. I am an actor and a producer. And tonight, I'm going to be reading the role of Ellen To. Good evening, my name is Claire Wong. I am an actress and joint artistic director and producer of Checkpoint Theatre. And I will be reading the part of Grace To, who is Ellen's sister. I am a successful lawyer. I was married to John, and with him, I have a daughter, Sam. I am now married to a wonderful woman, Leslie, and we have been living in London for many years. I'm a teacher. My husband, Gary, is the assistant pastor, and my daughter is called Rachel. I have just come back to Singapore for my mother's funeral. I've just discovered that my husband, Gary, has agreed to take up a missionary posting in Surabaya without telling me. No, 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 no. Yes. No. Yes. That's all you can say. Yes. You won't reconsider. No. Gary. You tell Gary to come in here and I shall repeat it to his face too. No, 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 no. I don't care how many times you ask me, I'm not going to come back here and look after that while you and Gary go a missionary in Indonesia. Gary has agreed. We have to be there by the end of July. That's not my cross. What is the point of becoming a heathen if the Holy Trinity can just turn around and call in the chips 15 years down the line? You aren't heathen. Oh no, here, read my lips. I don't believe in hellfire and brimstone. London in winter is frightening enough, thank you very much. I have 20 deals spinning in circles in the hands of an ambitious, backstabbing young associate waiting for my return. I've already taken more time than I can afford. I have to go back. This is a family emergency. I wouldn't ask you otherwise. Well, it is. Your families. <laughs> no, no. Don't start with the my family, your family. It's not my spouse who accepted an appointment to Surabaya without consulting me. It's not my business that there is trouble in paradise because Adam agreed with the snake to quit Eden without telling Eve. You don't understand. Damn strict, I don't. Gary believes that God has specially called us to this ministry. Good for him. But I don't hear any calls from God to switch from corporate lawyer to nursing home operator. <laughs> hello? Hello? Any calls from God? <gasps> Lines must be down. Oh, yes. Now I remember. I believe I stopped paying the bills a while ago and they told me they were stopping my service. <gasps> oh, wait. I hear the phone ring. <laughs> yes, Chuck? That agreement? Well, there's been a delay, you understand. God's call before yours. <laughs> no, he didn't call me directly. He fucking left me a voicemail message via a Singapore Telecom's call waiting operator named Pastor Gary Ang. I don't think you should be so blasphemous. <laughs> As if you are so keen to go. It's not up to me. I'm a bit out of touch with these celestial matters, so you have to help me out here. <clears throat> Gary gets called in a divine manner, so the whole family has to pack their bags and grab a Garuda flight. The minister's family has to be there too. Ah. We will have a ministry too with the women and the children. Gary will need me to help teach Bible classes. You should know that. So you don't get a confirming telex too for your own personal records? God has a family discount on calls. One call fits all. <laughs> okay, look, I'll be honest with you. I didn't expect this, you're right. Now I also have to apply for no pay long leave. If necessary, I have to resign and I have to worry about Rachel's education while we're away. I have to teach her myself to make sure she stays up to a year. I'm worried. But I accept that God has spoken to Gary and Gary wouldn't do this lightheartedly. Please. I have a job, a home, a life right now. And in case you haven't noticed, it is not here. I have clients who, for some masochistic reason, want me to draft their euro bonds for them. And I have magazine subscriptions, which I would have to redirect to Singapore in brown wrappers so customs won't confiscate them. <laughs> this is not a convenient request. It would be temporary, just for a year. Hey, I wasn't born yesterday. Your mission statement is to convert heathens. It could take forever with the message you've got. <laughs> Couldn't you take a sabbatical? I don't know. Nick Adams did that in 92. And guess where they've slotted him now that he's back? 
international resource admin partner. He's the bloody librarian, for God's sake. If I give it up, there is no guarantee I could ever step back in. It's, it's not even just a job. I, look, I can't expect Leslie to move over here at such short notice. I know you and Gary are doing just that, but I just... Oh. What do you mean, oh? Nothing. You didn't think I would have to consider what she wants as well? Sure. Then? I told you nothing. That's bullshit. Okay. Okay, what is this? Okay. You weren't expecting me to drop everything and come out here without her? No. Don't get all sanctimonious faced on me. What did you expect us to do? Send the occasional postcard to each other? Having a lovely time. Wish you were here. It won't be for so long. Okay, there is something seriously wrong with this picture. <clears throat> You have to go with Gary because he sees visions and hears voices in his head. Because when God calls, he doesn't just call John Boy, he calls the whole bloody Walton's family. But I'm supposed to dump my family and step into the breach? Look, it's really only for a year. No such luck. If it's my family God's calling, then there's the two of us, Leslie and me. Or do you think it's different somehow for us? I'm sure you don't think so. What? the fuck hell is that supposed to mean? I don't know whether it's different or not. How should I know? How shouldn't you? What's so different here? You tell me. Look, I really don't want to argue with you about that. Why not? Why don't you want to talk about it? We have a logistical problem here, and if you think you need to talk to Leslie in order to make a decision, I'll respect that. You know I do. No, that is not good enough. It's not whether I think I need to talk to my spouse about this. I know I do. What I want to know is why you think there isn't any need I to. did not say that there was no need. But you assume. I don't want to argue with you. If you both decide to come out here for a while, that would be great. And you can both stay here with that. Well, thank you very much, Your Highness. Where else would she stay? In a Strand Hotel renting by the hour? Gary and I... I have always tried to make Leslie welcome. It's not our fault that you two are miles away. Remember, we even invited you to the wedding. And instantly regretted it when we accepted, I'm sure. It was not easy for us, you know. Oh, now it comes out. Why? Did we embarrass the assistant pastor and his newlywed wife at the church, French kissing behind the altar? Jeez. Christ's sake, Grace! At least we came, which is more courtesy than you ever I told you before. I'm sorry about that. I got okay. help. Okay, oh. sure. It's past. It didn't matter anyway. But for you, Grace, for you, we both put on dresses and foundation. You may not be aware of it, but that is a major concession for two dykes to make on a weekend. We aren't stupid. We tried to blend in. Come on, Grace, you didn't really expect us to wear wigs just because Pastor Ang thinks a woman's hair is a crowning glory and she should wear it long. Why didn't you sit with the family? I'm sorry? Why didn't you sit with the family in the first row? We sat right behind them. People noticed. Fat cousin Martin and his anorexic wife flew in from California for the wedding and wedged themselves next to mom, remember? But there was one more space. Well, pardon me, I must have missed the place setting. Some people notice. Yeah, right. People have nothing better to do than notice something as inconsequential as that. It gives new meaning to small-minded. It was unusual, that's all, that you would choose to sit in the next row. And John and Sam? They came! But they weren't with you. Hey! What is this church you attend? A school for aspiring gossip columnists? It was just difficult for Gary and me. He is the assistant pastor. The congregation looks to him to set an example. Has he been giving you grief about this? No, that's not it. So? We embarrassed you? Did we? Your lesbian older sister and her lover? Don't get nasty. Okay, what is so nasty about that? You don't like the word lesbian? You find it nasty. How about dyke then? Butch, carpet muncher, how about that? More graphic but less direct all at the same time. That should fit the bill. Why do you always have to be crude like that? 
Not everyone is as open as you are. At least they don't pretend to be. What do you mean by that? We've had Leslie over whenever she was around. Yes, but as what? Not like mum and dad always employing euphemisms, good friend, best friend. You should know better. But if you accepted her as my spouse, why would you be embarrassed that I sat with her? You would sit with Gary. Why would you assume that this decision to come back and look after Dad isn't a family decision for me as much as Gary's decision to go to Surabaya is a family decision for you? I will tell you why. Because you don't accept her as my spouse. You don't accept us. You patronize us. I would rather have to deal with people who openly insult us than to bear with this kind of hidden rejection. You can't expect people to change their mindset so quickly. How quickly do you want? Hmm? It's been six years. Oh, I've been married longer than you and Gary, for God's sake. I don't think you're being fair. Gary and I have tried our best to understand your relationship. Well, this kind of compassion I can do without. Well, maybe beggars can't be choosers. Helen, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean... Yes, you did. Well, you are the beggar now, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I've had enough. I should have known better, Jesus. I, I need a fag right now. <laughs> Here's a riddle for you. What's it take to get me back on the evil weed? A week back home in the loving bosom of church and family. E, I'm sorry. Please. What if Dad falls ill? What if something really serious happens to him because of us? You cannot threaten me with death. Dad's been doing a pretty good job of that all by himself. You go and figure it out. You should be good at that. But you can stop factoring me into this family equation. Just get me the fuck out. I should never have been part of it in the first place. Growing up, Every year, I would fall in love. A sec four girl, someone in the church, choir, it didn't matter. Sooner or later, I would fall in love and I would make friends with her and make myself an absolute pest until she'd come around. And for a while, she would be my best friend. And I would be the happiest person. Then God would tell me it was wrong. It was immoral, unnatural, and he would call me to repentance. Major Old Testament judgment language, and I would have to give her away. I would throw her away, callously, without warning. Imagine if you were the only straight person in a gay world. You are 13, and in every book, every movie, every poster, every advertisement, every fucking place you go, every single couple is gay. And you believe in a God who has condemned anyone who isn't gay. But in your heart, you can't stop loving the boy next door. Ridiculous, isn't it? Inside yourself, you're screaming, oh, oh, what the fuck is wrong with that? But you can't tell anyone. And one day, after months of thinking and worrying, you pick up the courage to tell your parents in the middle of dinner that you are an unnatural freak. <clears throat> and they look at you blankly and turn their eyes away and keep on talking about Sunday service and the fucking chicken curry and you sit there for the rest of the meal with snot dripping into your rice. You always have to make it about being gay. Don't you think they would have reacted in exactly the same way if I had told them I was pregnant? Why does it always have to be about being gay? You think dad is any more warm and fuzzy with me? You think mum ever nagged me any less? You think I didn't grow up wishing that I could gain their love and warmth and attention just like you? We were an equal opportunity family. 
Something for you, something for me. Nothing for you, nothing for me. Except that I was cursed with the inability to leave things behind. I was always the one to stay back and help clean up, just as it was always too easy for you to just walk away, to switch off. You were the master at that. You switched off from religion, you switched off from me and mum and dad, and then one day you just decided to leave all together. Well, you can't switch us off. We continue to live and breathe. We continue to grow old and to get ill and to die. We continue to love you and miss you. You used being gay as an excuse to shirk the hard work it takes to be part of a family, Ellen. You used to be close, you and I. We used to do everything together, to wear the same clothes, two sizes apart. And then one day, you decided that I didn't have it, what it took to understand you, and you cut me off. Thank you very much, uh, Claire and Kinghua, for that really powerful reading. Um, I myself felt very moved by this play, and it's actually one of my favorites because I feel that it brings to fore the tensions that we have to face within ourselves when our lifestyles and our choices and our values clash with the values of those that we really care about, uh, like our families, in the case of the play, right? our friends, and even more, more broadly, uh, with the people, the other people that we live together in this home that we call Singapore. And we see this happening more and more because Singapore is becoming a very plural society. Right? Uh, when we have values that touch at the deepest core of our being, we are very passionate about standing up for ourselves and we want to do that because that is who we are. But as we do that, we also have to confront the challenge of other people who disagree with us, standing up also very passionately for their own views. And what do we do when this happens? What kind of choices do we make in the way we negotiate these differences in values amongst ourselves? In our daily lives, in this society, in the common space that we share called Singapore, and what kind of choices do we make when the actions and the choices of other people really push at our personal limits? And going further, what kind of role does art play in this conversation? Do we allow art to be an uncommon kind of space where works of art with artistic value are allowed the permission to actually depict and take us beyond and educate us on what lies beyond the boundaries that society has set for us and the personal limits that we have set for ourselves. And the bigger question really is, amidst all of this plurality and differences, how do we arrive at common decisions that are going to affect, to affect all of us? Right? And if people disagree with these common decisions, how do we continue to care for the people with divergent views and who disagree? So we have tonight a very unique and groundbreaking space uh, there where we have the opportunity to discuss all these issues. We have worked very hard with the discussants uh, to, to curate a program where everyone uh, will have the opportunity to speak up, to be heard, to have your views discussed and to really count in this space that we have here. Uh, 
So without further ado, I'm going to move us to the next segment of our program, where we have invited six very distinguished commentators uh, to actually give a short presentation each on the topic. All six commentators have had the experience individually of navigating plurality in our society while remaining true to themselves. Okay. So our first commentator is Mr. Reverend Myak Siu. Okay. Mr. Myak Siu is the pastor of the Free Community Church, and he will be speaking about the relationship between religion and art. So please join me in welcoming Reverend Myak Siu. It's quite daunting to be the first person speaking. I'm not going to be commenting on uh, wills and successions because I thought that um, it wasn't that controversial. It was quite balanced in presenting both perspectives. And as a, pro as a religious person and a religious leader, um, I navigate within the church, but also I'm on the margins. I'm also gay, and I'm also part of an inclusive church. And I want to talk about the church. The church and this relationship with arts has gone back a long way. And historically, the church was a patron of the arts. From the very beginning, famous works by Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, um, and many, many others were commissioned by the church. And the artists often depended uh, on these commissions for the livelihood. So they had to avoid offending the church. The church had the power to censor whatever it deemed offensive, immoral, or heretical. The Council of Trent in the 16th century ordered the nude figures in Michelangelo's Last Judgment to be painted over, amongst many other paintings. The nude figures needed to be painted over because it was controversial. Today, the church continues its role as a censor and emeritus. When I was in seminary, we were to share um, a piece of art with our small group in our art and religion class. I picked a 1987 photograph by American artist and photographer Andre Serrano. Many of my friends thought it was beautiful. It was a red and yellow photograph of a crucifix. But when they learned that the title of the photograph was Emergence, Peace, Christ, and it featured the crucifix submerged in a container of urine, their reaction immediately changed to disgust. I wonder what caused that shift. Was it knowing what it was? But for it, the value of the beauty of the work, just on the surface, it was beautiful. I wonder if we can move beyond the visceral reaction and think about the meanings behind the photograph. Serrano himself identifies as a Christian. He said that his work is a critique of the billion-dollar Christ-for-profit industry. And this is what he said. The thing about the crucifix itself is that we treat it almost like a fashion accessory. When you see it, you're not horrified by it at all. But it represents a crucifixion of a man. And for Christ to have been crucified and laid on a cross for three days where he not only bled to death, he shed himself and he peed himself to death. So if a pissed Christ upsets you, maybe it's a good thing to think about what happened on the cross. That's exactly the opposite of what protesters and people who were objecting to the work were talking about. He actually had a religious understanding of the work. It is interesting that very often these religious protests or the protesters from the religious circles have not reflected on the work itself. They have not viewed the work. They have not experienced the work. I find it very strange that we can critique Beauty and a Beast and say there's a gay scene without having actually seen the movie itself. So if art is to be of public interest, then it requires engagement. Engagement is not just wanting to ban anything that's offensive. Engagement is reflecting on the work, reflecting on thoughts and emotions evoked within us as we encounter each artwork. Does it inspire us? Does it disturb us? Does it, why does it inspire us? Why does it disturb us? How does it disturb us? What is exactly going on in ourselves? What is it triggering? Is it critiquing something within ourselves? What does this art have to offer the larger public? 
The church does not have monopoly over the truth. The arts and sciences can offer truths that the church does not. The church needs to understand as a participant in the public sphere, the church itself will also need to be open to critique. As a critique of art, the critique also needs to know that it can be critiqued too. The church can clam up and it often clams up because it, it wants to protect itself from the critique itself. But in doing so, I think the church loses credibility and its role participating in the public sphere. How many of you have watched the Book of Mormon? I laughed my head off. But I have to admit, I thought if I was Mormon, I would be really offended. Yet, the, church, the Mormon church's response to the musical was very surprising. Instead of protests and violence and wanting to ban the musical, they issued a very mild statement. The production may attempt to entertain audiences for an evening, but the Book of Mormon as a volume of scripture will change people's lives forever by bringing them to Christ. The LDS Church even advertised in the playbills with the phrases, you have seen the play, now read the book. And the book is always better. Is this not, is this not better than slashing paintings? or photographs, of calling for violent protests, or calling for a ban, just because you didn't like what someone said. And I think that that is what I think the church has to re-examine its role and its relationship with the arts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reverend Miaxiu. And uh, I call on next, on our next speaker, Mr. Chu Zheng Si, a distinguished young lawyer and civil society advocate who is best known for being the founder of The Online Citizen. Mr. Chu will be speaking on the social and legal issues spotlighted in wills and succession and how they have changed or not changed since the play was Thanks first you. written. <laughs> uh, so uh, reading wills and succession uh, made me feel a bit sad. Uh, I couldn't help thinking when Elle wrote this in 1995, uh, whether she thought uh, 22 years later, uh, things, we would be looking back on the play, we'd be watching it, uh, and we'd be laughing because everything that happened in the play would be anachronistic because society would have moved on so dramatically and we have changed so much uh, that the social and the legal alienation that uh, Ellen and Leslie had to deal with in the play would no longer be uh, relevant in context and it would be something more of a period drama. Um, so it made me a bit depressed because uh, Ping Dots this Saturday, uh, we're looking on from 2017, our vantage point is now, uh, and nothing has changed. Nothing has changed legally, nothing has changed. Uh, we had the a repeal effort in uh, 2007 in Parliament. Uh, some politicians made some very good speeches. Mr. Bay is here, he made a great one. Uh, and then there were the attempts to repeal it in the courts. Uh, I did one of the cases in 2014. Uh, and that was the high watermark of when we thought uh, 377A could be repealed. Uh, so we are in a place now where gay marriage uh, and uh, the kind of social exclusion someone with a foreign uh, uh, same-sex spouse feels in Singapore uh, is still very much a legal and lived uh, reality. Uh, and so that's, that's depressing, uh, that's depressing. Uh, and I'm a lawyer, so to me, uh, these legal constructs, these uh, rights, they matter. Um, one of the emotional pivots of the play, if you read the whole thing through, is, uh, is the will. Uh, and that's, that's the will that's referred to in the title of the play. Uh, it's a document that a lot of us, we take for granted, eventually we'll make one, uh, we'll die with one, and it will tell the people we leave behind what to do with, thing, with the things we have. Uh, if you're, I, I mean, I know some families with, uh, with, with seven wills. Um, I, I, don't, I, I, I don't have uh, seven myself. Um, but what happens if you don't have one, right? What happens if you don't have one? What happens if you drop dead on the tre treadmill at Fitness First in Orchard Road? Uh, if you Die without, if you die without a will, uh, there's this statute called the Intestate Successions Act that uh, tells uh, those left behind how your things will be apportioned. And if you're a straight couple, uh, automatically a portion of that in certain circumstances goes to your spouse. Uh, that doesn't happen if you're gay. So um, these 
I, that's just one uh, example of, of how rights matter and uh, how I did feel um, uh, kind of the futility of it all, seeing it, um, uh, uh, seeing the, the, the same issues kind of uh, haunt us uh, to where we are now. Uh, but as a, a lawyer, I'm very, very aware, especially as an activist lawyer, I'm always aware, I'm keenly aware that society moves uh, so much faster and so much further uh, than the law sometimes. It moves so far ahead. Uh, and so I was looking back at what the legal landscape looked like in 1995, uh, at what society looked like in 1995, and how different it is from now. And there was this case I found in 1994, a really strange case. It was a guy who was cruising at Tanjung Room. And this was way before Grindr, Tinder, uh, even the IRC, right? So uh, people would cruise in public. Uh, the uh, attractive young men would stand at Ansiang, Tanjong Ru, Fort Road. Uh, and richer guys with uh, large cars uh, would uh, drive by and uh, pick these boys up. And so there was this uh, a gentleman, his name was Tan Bun Hong in 1994, uh, who, was, uh, who was cruising in his car. He uh, picked someone up. Uh, and proceeded, uh, the, the person said, well, you know, I'm, I'm here for whatever it is, and he started to touch him. Uh, to his horror, he found out that that gentleman was a plainclothes policeman, uh, and he wasn't just charged with 377A, he was also charged with outraging the modesty of the policeman who he had touched. Uh, it's bizarre, but uh, it's probably a mark of how, uh, even though the law stayed the same, we can't, in this day and age, imagine something like that happening in 2017. But we didn't get to this place uh, by sitting back and watching plays. We got to this place by people pushing things uh, in Parliament in 2007. Uh, in 2014, uh, the people who put their names to the lawsuits that challenge the constitutionality of 377A, and hopefully this Saturday by standing up and being counted uh, at uh, Ping Dot at Hong Lim Park. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chu jung -si, for that really impassioned speech. Uh, now I'm going to call on our third speaker, Dr. Jun Yap, who is an independent curator who will speak about the value of arts in society. Hello. So, what is the value of the arts? It's its value in economic and quantifiable goals, of bums on seats, the number of spectacular productions, huge ticket sales, endlessly clicking attendance counters, high returns on investment, generous levels of patronage, and getting as many social media likes as possible? Or is it in strategic value for the nation, such as in enriching the quality of life, the encouragement of creativity, the boosting of emotional and spiritual well-being, the strengthening of ties, integrating individuals and communities, and creating identity? Perhaps it is all of these, but it is, it is to the latter that I will speak to here. In the case of quantifiable value, what counts seems quite clear. But when the scope of impact is in the quality of life, well-being, ties and community, how value occurs is less obvious. Yet in relation to wills and secession, one of the ways in which such value is produced is quite simple, in an ordinariness. In the reading of the scene in Wilson's session that we just observed, Grace and Alan quarrel over Alan's attendance of Grace's wedding. What this verbal tussle reveals is a deeper conflict of indifference and unhappiness. Alan claims Grace is embarrassed by Alan and her partner. To Grace, Alan is being crude, and unlike Alan, not everyone is as open as she is and Ellen retorts that at least they don't pretend to be. Our worlds are sometimes so hermetic and contained. Difference and change appear daunting. It scares us that things are not what they seem, 
and we are moved to defend ourselves, to remain the persons we think we are. As the play continues, a few things happen. After Leslie moves in as Grace heads to Surabaya, Leslie suffers a lymphoma relapse and requests for Grace to return. While Leslie's health deteriorates, Grace and Leslie get to know each other, such that at Leslie's memorial, Grace announces that while the relationship between Ellen and Leslie has not always been an easy thing for her to understand or accept, but she does know love when she sees it. To Grace, Leslie's love for Ellen was as deep and as strong and true as any love she has ever known. Of course, it is arguable if Grace's position has shifted substantially or if it has merely softened a little. My point on the ordinary is not the extent of this shift, but how it occurs. In Act 2, Scene 1, just after Grace returns from Surabaya, Leslie asks Grace, Are we so difficult for you? Grace answers, Yes. Leslie continues, Do we seem so wrong? In London, whoever came home first would get dinner. Whoever was later would do the dishes and take out the garbage. Ellen would work late just to avoid dinner duty. On Saturday mornings, we would clean house, do the laundry, lug grocery bags up five flights of stairs. On Sundays, we would fight over the weekend paper, have friends over for dinner, run out of paper napkins. Earth shattering, wasn't it? But you know how it is already. And Grace, in an epiphany of sorts, agrees, yes. And you know that's exactly why it's so difficult. Earth-shattering? What Leslie meant was its contrary. That what was shocking was that her life together with Ellen was ordinary. In other words, not earth-shattering at all. Normal, in fact, and human in scale. So what is the value of the arts? Certainly, it is in the spectacle, in the grand gesture, in ever-increasing numbers and expectations, but it is also in revealing the reality behind the abstraction and in bringing to the senses the profundities of human experience in an articulation and in perspective. A moment for the simple and ordinary insight. Earth-shattering, isn't it? This is the value of the arts the ordinariness of our subjectivities. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Junior. And our fourth speaker is Mr. Alfred Saat, a playwright and a poet who will speak about uncommon spaces. Hello. Okay, actually, uh, this uh, piece it's called A Word on Uncommon Spaces, and it's actually published in the program that you have. So what I'm offering right now is the audiobook uh, version. <laughs> Condensed. In Singapore, we are used to the discourse on common spaces. This discourse probably intensified in the wake of what has been called the Tudong incident in the year 2002. In January of that year, four Muslim primary school girls went to school wearing the Tudong or Muslim headscarf. The reaction from the state was swift and firm. The girls were barred from entering the school and government statements were issued, which emphasized the importance of maintaining what was referred to as a shared common space. This common space is practically a secular space. It is a space where the state recognizes the freedom of religion, yet maintains a neutrality towards or an equidistance from each particular religion. Furthermore, the term common space refers to not only a multi-faith, but a multicultural or multi-ethnic society. In a speech delivered in December 2013, Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong described what he saw as particular demands from each ethnic community. According to him, the Chinese community wants more special assistance planned schools where Mandarin is the first language, and more public signs and train announcements in Mandarin. The Malay community wants women to be allowed to wear the hijab with uniform and more government help for madrasas. The Indian community wants the wider use of Tamil in public signs like at the airport and support and status for other Indian languages besides Tamil. 
It is worth noting that many of these demands do not, in effect, result in policies which disenfranchise other communities. Incorporating the hijab or headscarf into uniforms does not impinge on the rights of other women, both non-Muslim as well as Muslim, not to wear it. Also, it is possible to have public signs that are written in both Mandarin and Tamil, as well as Malay. Uh, many countries already feature multiple languages on various signboards. But this kind of formulation is strategic. It positions the state as an arbiter of what is framed as competing demands, even if technically they are not. The state thus demands various degrees of cultural effacement and neutralization by each community before they are deemed eligible to participate in a common space. There's something deeply infantilizing about this discourse, as if the different communities are somehow unable to be mindful of the sensitivities of others when they request for certain provisions. Invoked time and again in speeches and interviews, the idea of this common space has become dogma. And instead of celebrating diversity, the common space insists on conformity to certain social norms, and one would argue even assimilation into a dominant culture. It is our tendency to speak of uh, the English language or Western modes of dressing as cultural practices that belong to no particular community that makes us overlook how they are manifestations of a particular kind of Anglophone, Western-oriented, capitalist hegemony. The common space, that guarantor of both racial harmony and national security, is therefore not a space for the negotiation of difference, but a space for the disciplining of difference. And thus, for the sake of a more progressive politics, I would like to propose a counter theory, that of the uncommon space. If the common space is one where social norms are observed, the uncommon space is one where these norms are suspended. There, there are spaces of exceptionalism, open to the public, but which operate with their own closed-door system of rules. It is important to emphasize, however, that the law of the land still applies to these spaces. What they are exempted from, however, are the kinds of behaviors which regulate what is often termed public morality. There are already forms of uncommon spaces in society. They include the church, the theater, the brothel, the gallery, the mosque, the discotheque. In some of these spaces, public morality is over-regulated. In others, it is under-regulated. The most important thing is to note that the uncommon spaces I've listed do not often overlap. But their existence is crucial, especially the ones which are under-regulated. It is this margin of freedom which allows us to have extra daily encounters, often with those who are radically different from us. Our common spaces must be nurtured, but our uncommon spaces must also be protected. Instead of always thinking of how the public should be protected from certain ideas or images, perhaps it is time to look at how we can protect these uncommon spaces from the public, or rather from certain vested interests, be they authoritarian, reactionary, conservative, theocratic, that act under the guise of the public. Thank you, Mr. Alfian Saad. Our fifth speaker is Mr. Imran Taib, an interfaith activist who will speak about diversity, false divides, and unheard voices. There is a Malay saying, um, rambut sama hitam, hati lain lain, which is loosely translated as, we all have the same black hair, but our hearts are different, or rather our thoughts, our emotions, our feelings. Pardon uh, to those who have different hair color and uh, no hair at all, but that's not the point. The point is about the recognition that individuals have different ideas, different feelings, and different attitudes. And this is a piece of traditional wisdom that we often forget, and it has been buried under structures in societies. And structures in societies are shaped by the political process or the management of the very diversity. I think this is one very important point that we need to take into uh, account whenever we discuss about art, because art itself has to contend with the political structures, with structures in society, and this is where we deal with issues like censorship and offense. 
The operating model in Singapore society for very long has been through representational politics. Because each individual have different ideas and attitudes, the state cannot directly deal with every single individual. It has to deal with some kind of representations uh, that somehow speaks on behalf of the communities that are being lumped together under a category. Remember the CMIO model? Or even now in religion, there is a representation of Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, etc. Now, this brings the whole difficulty uh, and also the question of who gets to represent this whole category of people that we call, oh, the Christians believe in this, or the Christians' attitude towards, let's say, LGBT is this. Uh, or the Muslim's attitude or the Buddhist attitude, but who gets to represent whose voices are heard and whose voices are not heard is also something that we need to think about. And who gets to the negotiating table to also represent their interests is also something that we need to think about. So this old model, whether it's tenable or sustainable in the long term, uh, is something that we need to think together. Because with the democratization of the public sphere, especially with the emergence of social media, uh, we are in, uh, witnessing new tensions that are emerging in society, not because of the very diversity itself, because it has been natural, it's been there, but rather with the whole issue of how inclusive as a society we want to be. And the lack of inc inclusivity has been observed to be the root cause of many of the tensions and conflicts in other societies because an out-group and an in-group dynamics is where the root of the tension is. Because once a group is being seen as an out-group or feels themselves as being an out-group, that is where resentment develops and therefore the divide becomes more deeper and deeper uh, within society. So how do we deal with this then? One way is to question whether there is a need for one centers of authority or we can think of a different model where we have multiple centers of authorities. Secondly, as what Alfian had said, that the state's role as an arbiter, can it be evolving into a new form where the state is not an arbiter between competing interests because the, centers can no long, the center can no longer hold within this deep diversity that we are witnessing, but rather has a detached referee that actually uh, makes sure that people do not cross the line into hate speeches, into violence, etc. but the state itself remains detached and observes the whole conversations uh, uh, that are happening on the ground. Uh, and also the whole issue of whether it's desirable to have a consensus or rather to allow freedom for each community, each group uh, to, to, to live their life the way they, they feel that uh, it, it will enrich their lives uh, as long as it does not uh, impinge upon the rights of the others. Because if we go by the old model of going by consensus, then there will be again the in-group and the out-group and the whole resentment process will come in. Now, I want to bring to the second point uh, of rambut sama hitam, hati lain lain. This whole idea of hati, yeah? In traditional societies, it is the seat of consciousness rather than the otak or the fikiran akal, right? Uh, and this is interesting because in traditional society, it recognizes that the seat of consciousness is more residing in the heart. The thinking is from the heart rather than from the mind, which then brings us into this whole idea of the liberal bias of thinking that things can be resolved if we rationally discuss things. Because in a public sphere, people do not approach an issue from a purely rational standpoint. People already have a certain attitude towards a particular uh, divisive uh, or contentious issues, and then they try to rationalize whatever feelings that they have already towards that particular incident. Think of a cockroach, for example, right? Does it make, do you rationalize why you are averse to cockroach? Or you are already averse to cockroach, then you try to rationalize it later on. And maybe because it's dirty or you know, it's, it, things like that, right? This is precisely the point that Jonathan Haidt has raised in his book, The Writer's Mind. And this is something that we need to think about when we want to bring issues into public discussions, how much of it can be rationally uh, discussed or do we approach it from a different angle? And this is where art can come in because art brings in the personal narratives and 
and the lived realities beyond just discussing right and wrong. Uh, and this is where the functions of dialogue, of providing safe spaces, uh, and also where art can engage in the lived realities of the people that can engage with the emotions more than rather than a dry, uh, rational discussions on the ground. Those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Inman Taib. And our last speaker is Dr. Ad Molo, a cultural anthropologist and urban ethnographer, who will speak about heteronormativity and intersectionality. Okay, That's thank you for pronouncing the long words. Um, so Tolstoy said that all happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. You see this quote everywhere. Hallmark Channel, church bookshops, on fridge magnets. Um, Google image search family, and yes, they all do look alike. And you add happy to your search. I just did it in my office. And you get even more images of a male and female laughing, swinging, equally happy looking children, sometimes with pets. And in an increasingly aging society, oftentimes with grandparents. So they're including grandparents in the picture now. So this is a stock image often reproduced in its likeness, an alibi for a myth that has been silenced. What has been silenced? The labor of love that goes into making a family and the unequal landscapes that position some forms of love, care and belonging as more deserving than others. So the heated exchange between Grace and Ellen is not about heterosexuality versus homosexuality. It is not about shitting on lesbians or shitting on religious, pious women. It is about the production of heteronormativity, which assumes that the supposed happiness of a male husband, female wife, and their laughing offsprings is the only norm that other relationships of intimacy and care should be measured against. So the notion of family, family has been so taken for granted as natural that people often forget how it is accept, assembled and constructed based on the powers that be or what people think is possible within their lived realities. Take Singapore, for example. Have we ever questioned where these Asian family values come from? And now that Taiwan has basically uh, legalized same-sex marriage, thank God we can no longer say that all Asian family values are the same. So how was the Asian family values constructed in Singapore? It was actually brought to us by the British, who in the early 1900s felt that Asian people are disgusting in their family behaviours. There's no proper family tradition. Chinese men are having sex with each other. Chinese women are, have sworn virginhood. Um, and Malay wives or Malay midwives are basically helping people birth the wrong way. So that was the impression, and they introduced the proper family value. So, so much for Western dec decadence. So, basically, that the family that each of us have or are pursuing, whether traditional or not, are mediated by our access to particular resources and rewards, our life experiences, and how we have been socialized to think about family. So by suggesting that certain paths to family are more natural than others, it means to privilege only the model of family while delegitimizing other versions of family and other celebrations of happiness. Therefore, any claims for family inclusivity and deservedness require a precise examination of who and what people are and how it informs the choices that they make. To understand privilege is to take an intersectional perspective. This means seeing heteronormativity, or rather the traditional family, as a matrix of power where multiple categories in terms of who you are, your class, your gender, your sexuality, your ethnicity, your religion, your disability, amongst others, are all interconnected and shapes your experiences. So to read Grace and Allen is not to participate in Oppression Olympics. It's not to see who has had it worse or who is more privileged than the other, but to find spaces where oppression and privilege both interact and intersect. Does Grace have any more right to be with her husband in Surabaya than Ellen, who has to return to London and be with Leslie? And we ask the reverse. Does Ellen have any more right to be with her wife than Grace has to follow her husband? Is staying behind to take care of ailing parents who have supported you any more valid than leaving parents who cannot and will not accept you? 
we ask the reverse to is leaving parents who cannot and will not accept you any more valid than staying behind to take care of ailing parents who have supported you. Is caring out of duty any more self-actualizing than caring out of love? Is caring out of love any more self-actualizing than caring out of duty? So is answering one's sexual preference any more legitimate than answering God's calling? And is answering God's calling any more legitimate than answering one's sexual preference and desire? So when we pit the very fundamental human need to feel connected, loved and belong as a matter of deservedness and worth against dominant representations, we stop to see the validity of each other's existence and the plurality of experiences that comes from making and being family. So my parting words is this, privilege is like tissue paper. You can use it to choke your space on a dirty table and prevent others from occupying them. Or you can take that tissue paper, wipe that dirty table clean so others can join you. What would you choose? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Adam. Thank you to all our six speakers for raising such wonderfully complex philosophical issues in this discussion. I uh, personally enjoyed how all of you spoke about how choices are made, whether some are more legitimate than others, whether some are worth more than others, uh, who gets to be hurt, who doesn't, who gets to make what choices. These are, these are very complex issues that I'm sure we have a lot to talk about. So in the next segment, I'm actually going to open up the floor to our discussants first and all, uh, to engage with our commentators. Okay, discussants, all of you have a paddle. So if you have a feedback, a comment, uh, something that you want to say, a gift for the floor, a question for the commentators, please raise your paddle. And I ask that since we have limited time today for all of you to make your feedback uh, a little bit more succinct so that we can have as many people as possible have the chance to speak. Discussants. Okay. Yes, the lady on number thirty two, please. Right. So, um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I wanted to ask um, um, about your, your views on, on uh, the notion of horizons. And since we're an island, um, a horizon is kind of always there and it's kind of difficult to reach. Um, I was at a seminar yesterday and uh, there was a discussion about um, when a place has very high level of infrastructure it is very difficult for people to have uh, an adaptive um, position. And so uh, those people are less likely to become, to want to adapt and to change. So I asked the question whether or not a place like Singapore actually needs, we have high infrastructure, we have supposedly people who are complacent. So the first thing I want to ask is, are we complacent? And so therefore you're trying to stir up something and so this stirring up something through art, do you need to suggest that we need to have a flood of some sort, like a real crisis? Do we need a crisis before we become, um, I'm gonna put that in quotes, a better society? And is that what art is supposed to do? So as practitioners, uh, I suppose the, the ones in, in, in playwright and in, in art, are you, um, are you for a situation where you're not just provoking, but you really want to start a crisis? <laughs> <laughs> Starting crisis. So any of our artistic commentators would like to respond to that? I would just respond with one sentence from my perspective is, um, discomfort is the catalyst for change. If you're comfortable, you're not going to change. You're, you're the <laughs> you, you, you get your answer as well. Wait, so your, your, your conclusion is that we need to get a little uncomfortable, is that? Okay, um, well, based on the line of thinking and the presentation that I gave on the subject of the ordinary and the not so earth shattering, then theoretically, um, no, we should not require 
uh, a crisis in order to come round. But um, so based on that, that my comment earlier, um, rather it is that um, the nature of our differences that already exist as they surface will produce situations where we will have to confront. But that confrontation is already a confrontation of something very ordinary in each of us, ourselves. We do not feel we are alien. We feel the other is. So on that basis, there is actually no need for, say, an external crisis, or perhaps the crisis emerges from um, the, the encounter of the other already. And the extent of that crisis could be small, it could be large. Yeah. Um, I'm not in favor of manufacturing crisis just, to, <laughs> just so that we can demonstrate adapt, you know, uh, our adaptivity or creativity or flexibility, etc. I think there are, there are other solutions to that, actually, which is basically to create freer conditions for creativity and innovation to flourish. I think if you want a crisis to lead you to, to, to become more creative, I, I think it's a very uh, costly uh, method, right? People die, um, cars drown uh, in floods and all that. So I think that there, are, there are easier ways to do that, you know, greater, uh, not, not so much bureaucracy, for example, um, uh, little spaces, pockets of freedom here and there. Um, so I think that, that would be my preferred uh, course of action. I'll add another note to that. Um, the thing about crises in arts is that um, I think you, on the one hand you have crisis um, of, of perhaps a moment of reflection of an encounter of something new, but the other kinds of crises that are um, produced in order to get you that, to that point of reflection are in fact fictional. So they're not real crises in a sense too. I think one way is to look at it from the lens of uh, crisis from whose point of view, uh, because there are people who are privileged in society and therefore they feel that everything is well and dandy, right? But there will be communities who feel that uh, they are in a state of crisis because it directly impacts their lived realities, right? So the idea of art bringing up those voices that are not heard will be upsetting to those who are in a privileged position, but it can be empowering for those who are actually suffering on the ground, right? So the idea is actually to bridge the gap and therefore people are able to see it from the lens of the other and understand the lived realities of the other and see how we can actually work together to lessen that suffering and perhaps that's where uh, art can play a role in bridging those two. And also when you mention horizons, horizons are also largely interpretive as well. So we exist in a plural society where there are different interpretive horizons. What can you see within your horizon may be very different from someone else's. You, you can see the horizon as far and wide, whereas someone has an entire HDB flat blocking their horizon. How do you move from there? <laughs> so the idea about crisis is that when you live in a society where we occupy multiple categories of identity and we are fragmented, um, it is rather impossible, I think, to find a crisis that binds all of us together, natural disasters notwithstanding. Yep. Unless if you watch Handmaid's Tale, then that is one disaster. Yep. <laughs> um, hi. So I was struck by what Mr. Imran Tai talked about, uh, how a lot of things are emotional. Um, it brought to mind an anecdote where there was a teacher I really respected. Um, he, during a class, he talked about his childhood days uh, in school and he referred to a, like his gay friends as a faggot. And I was like really shocked because there was a gay guy in my class and obviously my teacher had no idea. Um, but... I think after 10 years or so, he's well known as a social entrepreneur and all that. And he then talked about how he attended a wedding of a colleague, a lesbian colleague in New York, and how he was disgusted by the gay pastor. But, you know, I was still there to support my lesbian friend. And so I think, yeah, a lot of it, it's about praise and how you like re how you are uh, positive reinforcement of, of the behavior. Like, oh, you know, at least you made some effort to, to uh, bridge that gap or try and be comfortable with someone else's differences. And 
a lot of it boils down to likability and personal relationships. And my question of what I wonder is like, how much responsibility lies on both sides? Like, let's say very religious people versus gay and lesbian people. And uh, yeah, I'm just wondering like the extent of responsibility and, you know, there's a discomfort, but does likability and personal relationships play a part? And when does it work? When does it not work? Yeah. I think in all my experiences and my, the experiences of other religious communities, um, I learned earlier this year from the United Church of Canada, the process they went through um, reaching the point where they accepted ordination of LGBT people. And that was back in the 80s. And what happened then was when they were going, they were supposed to um, have the general conference, right? And each, um, each uh, area sent a representative to vote. And a lot of them were told to vote no. What happened then was the LGBT people of the denomination set up a booth outside the hall of the, and they invited people to chat with them to get to know them. And when they went in, they could not make the decision to vote no. And they had to throw out the entire motion and recast the question is, all people should be able to be ordained in our church, which was a different formulation that LGBT people should be able to be included. They worded it as all people. And then when they went back, they had to, they have to wrestle with answering to their constituents in some way. It took them many years, but this is the thing. It's when you talk to someone, it is like what Imran said, it's not about the, um, the, the arguments or the intelligence or, no, or making rational. You cannot change people's minds until you break their hearts. So knowing what people struggle through then you realize, oh, you went through that. And I think that, you know, reading through the whole script of Wills and Succession, I saw that the, Grace's heart was broken. She got to know Leslie. And that's why, you know, at the ending, well, when I was reading it, I went, whoa, you know, like tissue paper, you know. I, it, it broke my heart too that she arrived there. Yeah. So I think that we need to break people's heart. And that relies on relationships and the willingness to talk to each other. The question is, are people willing to come to encounter the people who are different? Um, and that happens on many layers, right? Not just on the LGBT issue, but encounter people who disagree with you uh, on, the other, on the other side. And that's where I think the state, the arts, all can play a role, where bringing people with diff opposing views come together. One way to actually try to understand the fears that both sides have Right? Uh, especially amongst those that, uh, well, in, in the first place when you mentioned uh, between the uh, what, uh, highly, re deeply religious or highly religious and those who are LGBTs, I don't think that, I think that's a false divide because I know LGBT people who are also highly religious. So just to put that aside first, like uh, Miak is highly religious <laughs> <laughs> and he's even leading a church. Uh, now, uh, it's to understand the fear, and, and I work in interfaith uh, or interreligious relations. It's a similar thing that we have, where some people are afraid of even coming into contact with someone of a different religious idea because they felt afraid that they might be persuaded to change their religious convictions. Now, if we translate that into how uh, people communicate in terms of their positions on LGBT issues, it's the similar fear that we can also understand of having to agree with certain things that they deeply uh, are disagreeable with, right? So what we can do is to, to, to emphasize that the idea of coming together and talking it out, it's not so much of trying to change each other's mind, but rather to understand the difficulties that each other is going through in life beyond all these theological arguments. So personal narrative approach is very powerful and that's what the, 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 the play actually brought out, right? So, uh, this, uh, you know, it's not about trying to make someone abandon their religious belief to say that homosexuality is, is okay. I'll say, fine, if you have that religious opinion that homosexuality is not okay, it's okay. But we can, we can agree to disagree, but that should not stop us from building relationships 
together and being nice and civil to each other and accept each other as equal citizens despite and in spite of our differences. I think that is key. Um, at the same time, I also have some issues with like um, basically meeting people who are different and then presenting a safe image for others to consume so that you're not the scary gay or the scary lesbian and you are respectable, you have a good job and therefore you should be accepted. By, by, by what means, you know, is this acceptance? Um, also another issue is that when you have LGBT people coming up front, coming out, and then basically putting themselves on the line, trying to ask for acceptance, are homophobic people doing the same things? Well, they get to hide behind anonymity. So who are we expecting to come forward and fight this so-called um, diversity battle, and who's hiding behind the lines? but their voices are so powerful. Where are these voices coming from? Is it a majority or is it two very noisy, coward people? Yep. Hi, Hi my name's Eric. Uh, I'm trying to reconcile some of the, the points the, uh, the moderators have brought up. So in one case, uh, since the writing of this, this play, nothing much has changed, as you, you said, right? Uh, and and uh, for Imran, you mentioned about art being able to assess, create an access point for the heart rather than for the intellect, right? Um, since, you know, the last 10, 20, 30 years, uh, let's, let's take the topic of L LGBT. Uh, there's been a whole plethora of plays in that space, right? Uh, and yet, nothing has changed, right? And does the art in, in that space that it plays in the role that it plays to say to try to hold up a mirror uh, to society and get us to be, perhaps confront our fears or confront the other, you know, find and navigate those differences. But do you really see that happening? Or in, in the case where some of these arts uh, represent a minority view or a challenging view or a community in crisis view, uh, does it only speak to the converts? Right? And only the same people who believe in those views come. And, and, and in fact, the art is, isn't necessarily the great leveler. It isn't necessarily creating those pathways to the heart. Uh, so uh, I'll start uh, because I think the question started from something I said in my comment. Uh, I'll tell you this, artists change a lot more minds than lawyers. Uh, lawyers, you don't see them until you need to and you kind of approach them the way you would the dentist or the doctor uh, <laughs> with some trepidation uh, and your wallet ready. Um, so, uh, these little spots of the legal battles and uh, what, what happens on the front lines in court or in parliament. Nobody really pays much attention. Uh, but I think as some uh, of you have, have teased out, uh, what really matters a lot more are the personal narratives, uh, the personal experiences and the exchanges uh, um, b between people. Um, so so that, 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 that's my two cents. Um, yeah. Imran? I just, uh, not trying to sound defensive, but <laughs> that, that comment you made about nothing has changed, for example, right? I, I do think maybe on the legal front, we don't see that, that you know, certain laws overturn. But I think in terms of attitude, in terms of, let's say, media representation even, uh, you know, when you would only see gay people if they've committed a crime or, or you know, if they're perverts and pedophiles that would die of AIDS. I think uh, the theatre um, and, and, you know, has been a space where you've got these other kinds of representations. And, and I think that's where it first maybe started out and then suddenly it's, it's you know, um, managed to find its way one day to mainstream media. And then we are noticing, A, even mainstream media has got not so negative portrayal of gay people. So I think it has that kind of effect. And it has been said, for example, like the theater is the avant-garde of these kinds of social representations, right? And then maybe film and then TV. Not, I'm not ranking, uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying uh, high film people, TV people, you, you are, we value you too. Uh, so, but I, I do think there's been some, some change. Uh, the second point is about this uh, preaching to the converted. And of course, there's some truth in that because let's say tickets for theater 
expensive, right? So we are only preaching to a middle class audience. Huh? But others feel um, it's very easy in Singapore to get disillusioned. It's very easy to be disenchanted, to lose hope. And actually, even if you are already converted, it's very easy. My God, election 70%. Oh no, what kind of a country am I living in? Um, it's always good to be able to huddle together again uh, after those battles with like-minded people and, and you know, um, gain hope again, right? So, so um, that's, that's a kind of defense against disillusionment. Even if you know, uh, you know, these issues here are so familiar to me, I'm not expecting to, be, to, to, to think differently after I watch this play, but it's a kind of reassurance, oh yes, you know, the, the fight is still on. People are still fighting the good fight. You know, this message is still out there. I don't feel so alone. Oh, um, sorry, what, one, one follow-up point I, I actually had uh, was that... Um, uh, we assume that uh, when uh, society progresses, uh, it does so for the better. Uh, one of the important things uh, that lawyers do actually do and that I'm, I'm actually quite concerned with myself is guarding against um, a ch things changing for the worse. Uh, so interesting, one of the interesting conversations I had about this play was backstage with King Wah, uh, when she said, I'm not sure what approach the census would take to it uh, now, if it was staged now. Uh, and so we uh, mustn't uh, be conceited enough to think that every time things change, the uh, societally necessarily progresses in a direction we uh, like or accept. If you look at the way uh, the regulations at Pink Dot have been shape this year, if you look at some of the bills that have been passed in Parliament on the Administration of Justice Act, if you pay attention to the upcoming Films Act review uh, and uh, the way censorship regulations have morphed over the years, these are things that actually um, uh, lawyers obsess about and think about, uh, or certain lawyers do, but uh, it, it does also have an impact on the way uh, the rest of uh, the country consumes information. I just want to reframe this a little bit because if supposedly uh, I'm a religious conservative, supposedly, yeah. <laughs> um, maybe I am a closeted conservative, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, supposedly, if, uh, if I'm a religious conservative, I'll be very scared of this discussion. In a way, because are we saying that we are going to use art to normalize homosexuality? And that is the very contentious point that they have, right? So perhaps. Uh, we need to reframe it a bit in a sense that we are not, uh, I mean, not we, I mean, it's not so much about using art as an advocacy to normalize homosexuality. If you put it that way, the religious convertists will, will then go into policing art itself. And then they will say, oh, this one is trying to have a gay agenda, this one gay agenda. You know, you get into a lot of problems with that. But rather, the function of art is to humanize what is human, about being human that has multiplicities and difficulties, like even the idea of family relations as what we observe in, in the play, that comes forth to humanize the whole situation so that we do not get into this whole divide that is based on stereotypes, prejudices, using of certain words that people have no idea what it means, but it's used against the other, right? So that's the function of art, at least for me personally. Um, and I'm thinking also, is, is art in Singapore always radical? I mean, um, have any one of you has any one of you seen conservative art, and what does that look like? So I, I'm not sure. I'd be curious to to watch. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much I'm for sorry. our commenting. Can I'll, I add? Uh, can I add to that very briefly? Okay. Um, you had a complex question. Um, so on the subject of uh, transformation, um, when I was thinking of what to say, to talk about uh, on the subject of value of the arts, transformation is one of the possibilities. And I had a brief discussion. Uh, well, we had a few discussions before all this came together. And uh, it was brought up, actually, by uh, an interesting point that was brought up when I was thinking of transformation by Nolina, actually, was that uh, she didn't think that um, the transformation of grace was that great. And that really stuck with me. You know, the fact that you no, know, maybe it wasn't a big transformation. She just, you know, changed a little. She didn't actually go 180 degrees. She didn't change who she was. And that was quite important. So I just wanted to make that point about, you know, the, 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 it's not, the arts is not a conversion program, you know. <laughs> so it doesn't work that way. Um, but the other thing about transformation is also that transformation doesn't happen like that. 
sometimes it takes a long time. Sometimes it's small steps. And then, you know, after three years, you find that maybe you're different. But then again, it could be from so many other different things and not just because of one play you went to. Okay, um, I don't want to throw this to the commentators because actually I feel that um, whatever comments I have should be thrown open to everyone who's here. Um, I just wanted to point out two, I just wanted to come out, I, I talk about two thoughts that jumped into my mind when I was listening to what some of them were saying in the, in the comments. Uh, one, the first thought is about when the word value when we apply it to arts. The word value is something that brings in as, uh, was said um, concepts of economics, concepts of money, of worth, but is art getting into a trap when it talks about itself, when it tries to justify itself by falling back on the word value? Because it does bring all that. There was a time when, you know, when art was uh, patronized by religion, where t at a time where, and, and, and during that time, art wasn't about value, art was about beauty, art was about Art was about what it inspired, what it moved people to. Is art getting into a trap when it starts to resort to the kind of 20th, 20th 21st century economic talk of value when it tries to justify itself? Um, and that kind of leads me on in a way as well to my second thought that I had when there was talk about spaces. Um, is art really more, less about value, less about the artistic value of what it's said or what it's done, and more about the kind of space that you're in. This is a space right now. This, this whole event is a cross between art and something different because of the space we're in. The space which is supposedly protected, a bit sacrosanct, uh, a place where we have agreed to come and be open with one another. And so is art more about the space and more about being that kind of uncommon space as Alfian mentioned? Um, and I can I, 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 I fall back a bit on a personal thing about why I was thinking so much about spaces. Um, I just came back from Turkey, and in Istanbul, I visited, and some of you may know the place I visited, the Hagia Sophia. Mm. And it is an uncommon space. You would never find something like it anywhere else in the world. A place where you go into it, and the whole, you, you see, like the moment you go in, where the altar used to be is a mirab, facing slightly off to a side, because you know, the altar was, the, the church was never built to face Mecca. You know, it faces off to a different side, but above it is a mosaic of the Virgin Mary uh, holding Christ the child. And you, when you look at that, you just go, this can't exist anywhere else. And I was really sad when I came back, um, actually when I was in Istanbul as well, uh, people were telling me that um, there was quite a strong push in Istanbul to, for, uh, on the part of um, Muslims there to reclaim the Hagia Sophia and make it a mosque. And right now, it's a secular space. It's a museum. Uh, Kamal Ataturk, when, uh, he, when Turkey went independent in 1926, soon after, he actually declared the Hagia Sophia to be a secular museum. And no religion was going to have a monopoly over that place. But they're now trying to claim it back and make it into a mosque. And when I think about what might happen to all those mosaics that were uncovered, you know, uh, and left there for people to see, and, and I'm thinking about how, does, how do you preserve a space as special as that? And I'm thinking about also how, in that case, in Turkey's case, the government is apparently quite sympathetic to the Muslim uh, sentiment in this case, and quite willing to let it happen. And throwing that open to everyone, um, I just want to throw open the thought, who protects these spaces? Who can we trust to protect these spaces? Because as world events have proven in recent years, um, governments are not necessarily stable enough. They're not necessarily always going to be trusted to protect these spaces for us. And who is going to protect them? Who is going to police them? Who is going to be in charge of protecting these places if we can't trust, necessarily always trust governments to do so? Thanks very much, Karen. That was a great comment. Uh, we're running up against the 30-minute time limit, so I'd just like to take one more uh, question from the discussants, uh, maybe at 37, perhaps, before we open the floor to our audience questions, okay? And maybe to respond to Karen's comment later. Okay, so my question or comment really was about the change you... Uh, one of you mentioned about grace, grace's change, and how that was not as 
transformational, et cetera, et cetera, as we were talking about just now. And so my question is about uh, change and um, how, you know, dialogue can bring about that change. Because we talk about consensus and we talk about, you know, the two extremes, the, you know, the extremely religious and the LGBT and what happens if you're both and things like that. And um, I think surrounding this uh, conversation, right, the reason I was, I was talking about it with someone earlier, um, so this is art as res publica, so art as public good. So, and they were looking for diverse discussions, diverse participants. And so naturally, obviously those who are interested in art would be here, but also what about those who were not interested in art? And I guess my response to that question was that those who are vehemently, vehemently against art might actually make time to come down to be here, but not those ambivalent. So my question is, if you're looking at change and considering this is Singapore, change is a lot about consensus, how much of the voices we hear, I mean online and everything, so those are extreme voices. My question is, it's more of the ambivalence that I feel that um, needs to be addressed because let's say we talk about homosexuality or Pink Dot this Saturday, right? So there are those who are against, there's the against Pink Dot camp and there's the Pink Dot camp. But what about the rest of society who don't see it as an issue that needs to, even needs to be addressed at this point? So I guess that is my question, and perhaps Grace may fall into that category. If you're looking at the play, going back to the play, Grace may be someone who could fall into that category. Yeah, okay, I accept Ellen now, but I don't see this as a mass acceptance of, you know, all LGBT people. It's a, you know, case-by-case -case basis, personal relationship basis. So again, it's that engaging with the unseen majority or ambivalence that form the consensus, especially in Singapore. So any thoughts or questions about that? Any of the commentators would like to respond to our one last uh, discussion before we open it up to the audience? Um, I, I have a um, very short uh, comment to that. Um, I was just making a distinction between change and transformation and um, understanding. So um, while you may not have a, a very overt or obvious um, change in um, perhaps an opinion or perspective, uh, having some understanding though uh, would constitute some kind of shift of some sort. That was my very fine distinction I wanted to make. I think as in general, Singaporeans are very pragmatic. And human beings, we are also very pragmatic. If it doesn't, if it's not something that is going to impact me, it's something that I will not likely consider as much. I think that that's the, that's the general thing because we have limited bandwidth in the head and we only focus on things that matter and it will pass, you know, if it doesn't matter, we will not pay that much attention to it. And so the ambivalence often comes because they are not motivated to, to fall on either side. Number one, it could be they don't any gay LGBT person or it doesn't seem to be important to them in some way. The question, the question then is, you know, how do we bridge to understand that this, you know, and, and bring people to understand that this is as much about you, whether you have an LGBT person in your life or not. And I think that art opens up the opportunities for people to see something different, the opportunity to, to realize how other people's lives might be, and a glimpse into that. You, know, you don't get often a, a, a LGBT person inviting you to their house of you know, a glimpse into your personal lives. Um, I think often plays and films allow us to glimpse into other people's lives and their situations without, and, and open our eyes in some way. What follows after? The degree of transformation, what shifts there are, is a big question mark. I think that that's something that, that we need to pay attention to. I think one of the good films that, that really had an impact was um, Liang's um, Wedding Banquet. Um, and I don't know how many of you watched that. It's quite amazing. I'm not going to give you the, the spoiler. But my mom used it to tell my dad that I'm gay. <laughs> She, she, she came to my room, she knew my DVD collection, she went like, uh, Neo, like Liang, and then I just passed it to her. Then she, da, 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 da. then I went like, why did she borrow that? Then, you know, I have an inkling of what she was going to do with the film. 
And I think that I have friends who made parents walk, sit through some films and then came up to them with that. It, often, it, it helps us to communicate something. Yeah. I just want to give one example. Uh, there was an interfaith dialogue that was done. Uh, it's on faith and sexuality. Uh, and there, there is this community leader who was involved in, in, in the discussion. It's a small group discussion. And then one of the participants decided to out it himself. They, oh, I, by the way, I'm, I'm gay. And this community leader was, was totally shocked. I said, oh, you don't look like a gay. <laughs> So, I mean, like, how is a gay supposed to look like, right? <laughs> so, but that becomes a teachable moment because that person then realized that, you know, he has certain stereotypical view of a gay who's supposed to be effeminate, and he totally confuses the whole issue between your sex, your gender, your sexual orientation, and everything else. Uh, but after that uh, moment where, where the, you know, the, uh, everyone regrouped together and he shared, you know, how his views has been transformed just by meeting that person who looks to him, he used like, he looks perfectly normal to me, you know? <laughs> so that changes his views and that opens up an avenue for him to discover more about uh, many of these issues. And I think this is one example of a success uh, of bringing people together for a dialogue and to just break down that stereotype. So the idea is to replicate as much as this, bring people together and therefore they can go beyond this whole uh, labeling of each other uh, without meeting the person. Thanks very much, Imran. Uh, very well said, um, both Imran and past uh, Reverend Myaksu on how art opens our eyes, but the, the amount of priority we place on it after that really depends on each individual. So now I'd like to open up the floor to the audience for questions. Uh, we're running a bit short on time, so let's have perhaps two to three questions at the uh, one after the other, and then we'll have the commentators respond to all two or three questions, okay? So just raise your hand. Yes, the gentleman over there, and someone will be along with a mic. Uh, gentleman in blue T-shirt. Um, hi, my question is for Mr. Imram Taib. Okay, I understand you mentioned something about referees for the various increasing groups, for example, instead of having one representative, for example, for the Muslim faith, Christian faith, etc. So, um, because I understand that for our publications, for example, the Straits Times, they are out of bounds markers, OB markers. And um, for example, uh, Re uh, Reverend Apsi, you talked about how the church used to be a patron at the first time. So, would you say that these are uh, in a sense the same way we treat public good. They serve to show off the morals of the community at large and whether um, these would serve to also, unfortunately, serve the interests of what those want to influence the rest of society. For example, um, we see even for this event, CIFA, we see some cases of um, possible government intervention when uh, certain films are seen to be against Asian morals or against our society's norms. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so the lady in green as well has another question, so let's pass the mic to her. Um, I want to say very quickly that I love Keng Sen and this is a great moment in time to say it. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> in my nine years of reporting about the arts, I never got banned from uh, reviewing a theater play because I didn't review it. Um, the, the comment about OB markers, I think they are more in our head because I've gotten into enough trouble with each of my stories and I wish I had been thrown out of reviewing a theater play because it would have been a great thing to add to my CV. But I have a comment, not so much a question. Um, there was a comment about conservative art. I think you just have to wait for the 28, 2018 edition of the Singapore International Festival of the Arts. <laughs> Okay. Anyone has a last question for our commentators? Oh. <laughs> was <a> ouch. Oh. <laughs> wow, that was heavy. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Please raise your hand really high so I can see you. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, okay, our discussion, yes, all right, yes. Uh, I actually have been talking a lot about how art is an agent for change and conversation, but I think the real issue here should be on art education, because how are we going to prepare the next generation of arts consumers to be more open-minded to different ideas? I think that's something that we haven't touched upon at all throughout this entire conversation. I mean, um, for me, uh, arts education is a, a 
platform where people can open their minds and see the world in a different way. Arts education is, is a place where um, class barriers are broken. You get students from different backgrounds telling each other their stories through improvisation, through, through plays and things like that. So the real question here should be the focus on arts education programs, in particular among primary and secondary school students. Because we are talking about the shows we are going to produce, what our shows can do, what our art can do, but no one's going to watch your show if if the next generation of arts, uh, of arts consumers are not uh, grown from the ground up. So that is my big issue here with this discussion. We can talk in our ivory towers about the fancy shows we want to produce, but we really, really need to think about the grassroots level in terms of the young. That's what I'm saying, so that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for that, uh, for that comment. Uh, okay, now I know there are a lot of questions, um, but your next activity is actually break, so I don't want to hold everyone from, from break. So could we, could we have the commentators actually just respond quickly to those three questions? And if you have more questions, our commentators will be available during our break uh, for you to engage individually. Ah, okay, so, so it's a closing. <laughs> yeah, closing. My exposure to art education um, is in a university. I, I used to teach sociology and anthropology. And you'd be surprised that students find difficulty trying to unlearn how they see the world. And when I tell them what you come to know, this idea of common sense has to be deconstructed. They feel shattered and they actually hate me after class. <laughs> but um, I follow them through the entire semester and I see how they grow. When you give young people a chance to grow, when you don't limit your judgment because they are not able to understand and, and you kind of wait. Um, I find it very fulfilling to see my students grow and eventually come to see perspectives that are more diverse than what they are actually exposed to. I like the comment on art education, uh, but and I am I'm biased because I'm trained in philosophy, so I will say that what is important is also to teach philosophy right from young. <laughs> <laughs> Because then we'll, we will be asking the kind of question that has been raised just now. What is morality? Right? Because everyone comes say, okay, we want to protect morality, but what exactly do we mean by morality? And if we again translate that into the inter-religious scene, different religious communities even have different and opposing views on morality. I mean, if you have a very, very short skirt uh, among some Muslims, they will say this is immoral. Right? But does that stop us from interacting together and accepting each other as citizens uh, and everyone has their own space and, and, and you do not encroach and clamp down on the others whom you feel uh, deeply different and uh, opposed to from your personal value standpoint? So I think it's the same thing when we di discuss issues of morality in the public sphere. Who gets to define what is that morality? Or should we be rather discussing things like public good, uh, what is ethical instead of what is moral? So these are issues that can be raised if our children have been trained from young to, to ask the right questions, to ask the kind of deeper questions that can then translate into better public discourse and discussions as they grow up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> as a writer, I think literature is also important. So <laughs> philosophy, literature, religion will go, go all the way. Uh, no, but, but that's a very good point. Uh, I, I do feel, though, that sometimes some of these discussions that we are having has to do more with, say, a civics education than, than a purely arts education. You know, you can have an arts education and then still love very conservative art and Stanford Raffles musicals and that kind of stuff. But... Um, <laughs> You can, you know, but a civics education will make you a bit more aware of certain things, liberalism, democracy, terms of engagement in the public, those kinds of stuff, yeah. So that's also another area, I think, to look at because art appreciation could be something very technical, yeah. Well, so following from Imran, um, I studied philosophy and here I am now. <laughs> but um, I think the, the other point is that um, I think we don't want to limit education or the learning process to just children. I think you would like to be able to continue doing, you know, learning and exploring and growing um, till you're very old or something like that. <laughs> That's it. Um, so, yes, okay. Uh, I, I'm going to make the plug for legal education. Um, <laughs> 
and also kind of to answer uh, Karen's question about who protects these spaces or who has a responsibility uh, to protect these spaces and to touch briefly on the Beaker's uh, point about OB markers being uh, a bit more in our heads than real, right? Uh, I mean, uh, lawyers do play a role in society in protecting those spaces, uh, in, in, in fighting those battles, but Elfian's absolutely right. Uh, these are civic issues that it's not just for the lawyers or the artists or the writers to get engaged in. It's for society uh, more largely to get involved in. But it's our responsibility too, and I see that's my, part of, part of my, my uh, uh, purpose or my calling to uh, take myself out of my discipline and to make it engage with what's happening uh, uh, in, in, in society at large. Uh, so when um, we defend uh, against the state taking action against the real Singapore, uh, when we uh, defend uh, someone being charged for contempt of court, uh, that's a defense of a space or it's an attempt to push back those boundaries. It's an attempt to uh, make a point about how much uh, space we should have uh, and these uncommon spaces to make comments that would make people uh, uncomfortable and uh, uh, make society, well, a bit more diverse. And I started, so I end up closing. Um, I started with saying that the church should learn to be the critique of arts. How are we going to teach not just young children, but also adults how to be critical Critical, critically examine everything. Critically examine values, OB markers, um, what do we mean by art is a public good. Critical thinking, I think, is the, is the part that we need to, and, you know, that needs to be taught somehow. Um, critically thinking in religion. Critiquing our own religion. And not, all thing is, not all things within religion is good. All the patriarchy and uh, misogyny in Christianity, I feel, is not good. So I think that that's the, the, the key that, that we need to, to think about. And as a public good, then, you know, who defines what is the good that art produces? Can art be bad? And I, I really am concerned, you know, when you said, you know, teaching the children so that they become consumers of art, and then you defining the public good, it becomes a commercial, um, it becomes, art becomes commodified. While the church was a patron of the arts in the early days, it was not really a commodity. The art was for all to enjoy and appreciate, to see the beauty that's beyond, the good, the true, and the beautiful. So I want to, he I hesitate to teach people to be consumers of art. I rather teach people, children and otherwise, how to appreciate good art and be critical of art when it's bad, yeah. We need to push art in two ways. One, it's a way to uh, encourage critical thinking. But you must acknowledge that it's also a business and industry at the end of the day. So yes, it's good to expect critical thinking, but we cannot discount the fact that the commercial aspect is still there. And we want to talk about long-term sustainability of an industry, you must think about the commerce aspect of it as well. I mean, that's from my point of view. So, Thanks very much for your point of view. I think everyone has made great points here and I love that the discussion is lively and that we're going to continue it. Uh, however, it is now break times where you have actually a lot more time to, to think about how do we develop civic readiness and critical thinking and how do we apply this to art. However, before you go off for your break, you have homework. Okay, so now the discussant's homework is actually on the slide. All right. Now, in an artistic performance, there are actually two elements. The statements, which is what is said, what the text, uh, how, how the text reads, and the situation, which is the context in which the, te uh, the text is being read, right? The circumstances of the play, maybe the plot line. So the focus for today is on statements. And our task for the discussants is to consider all these statements which in normal circumstances might be considered very provocative or sensational or offensive. And I believe you are supposed to consider whether these statements should be allowed or censored when they appear in art. So for example, we do not say these things in real life, but what if it's in a movie? Should we allow this? Is this okay? 
Right? So that is our homework for the discussants, who will actually be in here throughout all 45 minutes of break, deliberating very hard in their small groups on this task. And as the audience, you have another piece of easier homework, which is to take the second survey as you exit this room. Okay? Someone will be at the door giving you the surveys. It's the same survey as you took uh, when you first stepped in here. So it's a measure of whether your views have changed on some of these issues. Uh, you also have a second task, which is to enjoy yourselves, uh, eat the food, enjoy the drinks. And if you have any other questions or views, please feel free to engage with the commentators who will also be breaking with you. OK? So uh, with that, I request that everyone be punctually back after 45 minutes, and we will get to hear the results of the deliberations of these statements from our discussants. Thank you. Great break, everyone.